those songs and scriptures were most appropriate for what we're going to be looking at right now in the Word. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're continuing in our exposition of Matthew. Thank you, Dan Tuggy, for your exposition last week on fasting, Matthew 6, uh, verses 16 to 18. And we're going to be going on verse 19 and following this morning. Years ago, singer-songwriter Jackson Brown wrote a haunting ballad called The Pretender, in, in which he described an intense inner struggle. It was a struggle between the pursuit of love on the one hand and the pursuit of money on the other. Between the, the happiness that comes from, from looking outside oneself and the happy, happiness that comes from indulging oneself. Brown was smart enough to know that he couldn't really do both. The choice was either or. And so after weighing the rewards and the value of each, after evaluating his own moral and volitional capabilities, he came to this conclusion. I'm going to be a happy idiot and struggle for the legal tender. That's money. And believe in whatever may lie in those things that money can buy. Though true love could have been a contender. Are you there? Say a prayer for the pretender. He started out so young and strong, only to surrender. By his own admission, it was a regrettable choice. A choice in which he forfeited something far more noble and more enduring than the artificial and fleeting happiness that money can buy. But it's as though he could not help himself. The lure was too appealing, the, the temptation too strong. Pretty sure Jackson Brown doesn't know the Lord. But his lyrics provide an insightful commentary on a similar struggle that a lot of us as Christians go through when it comes to money and possession. There are few things in the Christian life that produce more dissonance on the one hand and, and disconnect on the other than our relationship to money. For some of us, the lure of pursuing and putting our trust in wealth is almost irresistible, and it, it pangs our conscience. We're bothered by it. Others, however, don't seem to feel any tension at all. They, they, don't, they don't feel or see the conflict of interest. They don't understand that, that one cannot really love God and money at the same time, and so they try to love both. But either way, whether there is dissonance or disconnect, if we claim to love God but also love money, we are pretenders because it's impossible to love both. If we say we love both, we really love money and only pretend to love God. Because we're living as though God is not enough. By himself, he cannot really meet our needs or satisfy our desires. We need to supplement him with something else. Don't take my word for that. That's precisely what Jesus tells us. In this passage, Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some translations say mammon. That, that's a Aramaic word. It means money, possessions, the things that we call wealth. Let, let's be honest. Whenever Jesus talks about money, we get a little antsy. In a culture that is preoccupied with the things that money can buy, to a people who have been conditioned to believe that our happiness, our security, even our identity is determined by how much we have, Jesus' words have a discordant ring to them. Perhaps that's why so many of us in America have tried into tried to read into Jesus' words what we want to believe so that we can feel more comfortable about our lifestyle and our spending habits. We, we look longingly to the wealthy patriarchs of the Old Testament. We quote business advice from the Proverbs, scour the New Testament searching for rich people who do not get condemned. Conversely, there are some who believe that Jesus called his followers to renounce all wealth, all private property. Jesus condemned material possessions, they assert. And anyone who has more than what he needs for today is guilty of faithlessness. Thus, they say, we should forsake all and live a hand-to-mouth existence as we depend on God to supply our daily needs. Both of those views have gone to the Bible to answer the questions, is wealth okay? How much does God want me to have? How much does God want me to give away? And both views have missed the point because those are the wrong questions. Scripture doesn't answer those questions. Because those questions do not address the real issue. The real issue is one of the heart. What priority does wealth have in your life? How much does it occupy your thoughts or consume your time and energy? What emphasis do you place on it? You know, the answers to those questions are not difficult to determine because your actions reveal your heart. Look again at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. This exhortation is really an appeal to common sense. Jesus is telling us something that ought to be readily apparent to kingdom people whose eyes have been opened to the truth. He, he's saying, invest in that which has true value. Invest in that which is secure and will endure. Now, there's not a person alive who would dispute that advice. The dispute 
arises when we try to define what is secure. So what is a safe investment? Mutual funds? Treasury bonds? IRAs? Gold? Real estate? Not according to Jesus. He says, if you're looking for a truly safe investment, you won't find it in this world. The only investment that is truly safe are treasures in heaven. And those are the treasures that we ought to be laying up while we're on this earth. The word translated lay up literally means to stack. In, in ancient Palestine, people typically stack or stockpiled their wealth in, in one of three ways. They, they purchased expensive wool garments, some of which were embroidered with solid gold strands. And they were considered an investment. But these garments were a risky investment because Expensive clothes made a lavish meal for gourmet moths. And if moths ate a hole in a garment, it would lose its value. Other people stored grain. They would stockpile their barns so that in case of famine, they would be able to sell their grain at exorbitant prices. However, it is a well-known fact, even in Pratham, that, grains, that a granary is a rodent's castle. The word translated rust literally means to eat. Thirdly, people would hide or bury their gold coins in their homes. That, that wasn't a very safe investment either because homes were made out of baked clay that could easily be penetrated with sharp objects. The word break in literally means to dig through. Thieves were called diggers in this day because they could dig a hole in your wall and rob you blind in five minutes. Jesus is saying in verse 19 that it is ridiculous to put your security in earthly treasures because none of them are very safe. They are edible, corrosive, depreciable, vulnerable to threat, to theft. You might be thinking, but yeah, it's different today, though. We, we have... Uh, more efficient and effective ways of securing our investment. Do you really believe that? The, the only difference between then and now is that we have developed more sophisticated ways of prolonging a false sense of security. The Bible declares there's only two things that will last forever the souls of people, and the word of God. When we die, we take out of this world exactly what we brought into it. Nothing. And there are no exceptions. Isn't it ironic that the second wisest man who ever lived did some of the most foolish things ever recorded in Scripture. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon said that he tried everything this world has to offer. Riches, real estate, home improvements, work, sex, recreation, intellectual head trips. His conclusion it's all vanity. It's just chasing after wind. Haddon Robinson illustrates it well. 
he writes, in the game of monopoly, players buy land and collect money. When one player has enough money and at least one monopoly of properties, he or she can buy houses and hotels and collect rent on them. Eventually, one player receives enough rental money through land and building holdings to bankrupt the other players, thus ending the game. The Parker brothers, however, who are the makers of Monopoly, take for granted one final instruction. When the game is over, put all the pieces back in the box. <laughs> and so he writes, people who live for the present, who spend their strength on what cannot last are like children who play Monopoly as though it were reality. In the end, we all get put in the box and are gone. And so it's only common sense. We invest in heavenly treasures. Jesus says in verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Don't get Jesus wrong here. He's not pro-poverty as though being destitute was a virtue. He wants us to be prosperous. After all, we're his bride. Nothing is too good for us. But... The prosperity he's talking about, he want, what he wants for us, is real prosperity. The kind that lasts forever. It's what he calls treasures in heaven. And what is that treasure? Well, the text doesn't say. But we know from other scriptures that Donald Trump's fortune is a drop in the bucket in comparison. Bill Gates money seems like monopoly money in comparison. You see, the Bible says that we are co-heirs with Christ. And what is Christ an heir to? <laughs> Think about it. Everything. And we're not just talking about the cattle on a thousand hills, all the minerals and jewels and precious metals in this tiny planet called Earth. We're talking about galaxies and constellations and kingdoms in worlds unknown. But even more than that, we're talking about the riches of His grace. We're talking about unlocking the storehouses of His infinite love and being able to explore the depths of that love for all eternity. When we lived in Nairobi many years ago, we had some friends that lived in one of the city's many slums, Kibera. These slums consist of thousands of adjoining one-room shacks made of corrugated tin with no electricity, no plumbing, no bathing facilities. In Nairobi, over a million people live in slums. Our friends were devoted followers of Jesus. They were hard workers. They, they had steady jobs. But talk to them about mutual funds and IRAs and pensions. They wouldn't have a clue as to what you were talking about. Ask them where they planned to go on vacation. They would look at you with a blank stare. Ask them to project five or ten years down the road to a better paying job or an opportunity to move out of the slum. They couldn't make that projection because realistically it wasn't going to happen. They just hoped there was enough cornmeal on any given day to make a simple meal for their family. One of the men worked at a local hospital, a, a good hospital, relatively speaking. It was a decent job. He worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, 
He had worked there for eight years, never once had gotten a raise or promotion. He made two dollars a day. One day, while they were visiting our home, Mindy asked them an interesting question. She said, what do you have to look forward to? Mindy was always asking questions like that. They replied, our hope is in the Lord and in our heavenly home. Mindy pressed them, yeah, I I know it is, but, but what do you have to look forward to right now? They said again, our hope is in the Lord and in our heavenly home. And it really was. I would suggest to you that our friends were doing what Peter exhorted us to do in his first letter. And he said, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you. When Jesus Christ is revealed. They were also, by putting their complete hope in the Lord, storing up for themselves treasures in heaven. The Apostle James made a very interesting comment in his letter. He said, has not God chosen the poor in this world? to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom. When we teach and train pastors in some of the poorest countries of the world, pastors who don't get paid for their work, but pastors who are rich in faith, I sometimes say to them, you know, brothers, sisters, I'm not sure I'm going to see you in heaven. They look at me bewildered. You're going to be so close to the throne, and I'm going to be so far back, I'm not sure I'm going to see you. Once again, it's it's not that poverty is a virtue, nor does being poor make a person rich in faith. I've seen plenty of poor people in developing countries who love money just as much as we do. But poor people are more inclined than wealthy people to trust in the Lord than in money. Simply because they cannot trust in what they do not have. Many are compelled to put their entire trust in the Lord and that makes them rich. Jesus sums up this principle in verse 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A treasure is not just something you consider to be of great value. It is something you put your hope in. A a treasure is something you think will provide security, peace, contentment. Something you think can rescue you from your problems. Something you think about a lot. Something you hold on to tightly. Something you think you cannot live without. Because of that, your treasure, whatever it is, will govern your life. That's what Jesus meant when he said, your heart is where your treasure is. When I was a boy, I left my heart in San Francisco, particularly at Candlestick Park where the Giants played baseball. During baseball season, I listened to every game on the radio, devoured the sports page every morning, and wore Giants memorabilia whenever I could. I I knew by the time I was seven years old, every player's statistics, every player's strengths and weaknesses, and I could imitate every player's batting stance. The Giants consumed a large portion of my thoughts and time and energy. To some degree, my emotional well-being was determined by 
whether they won or lost. And it took me many years to realize that making the San Francisco Giants my treasure was not just an undependable and unpredictable investment. It was a terrible investment. They had more losing seasons during my childhood than winning seasons. It's easy to look at that and say, well, that was just a childish thing to do. And it was. But isn't it just as childish to make money or wealth our treasure? Look at what Jesus says in verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? These are difficult words, but follow me. This is a parable in which the soul of a person is pictured as a room. The eyes are the windows of the soul that illumine the room. In order for the room to be full of light, the eyes must be healthy. By the way, the root word for healthy is singular or undivided. In other words, a healthy eye is one that is able to focus and stay focused. A person with healthy eyes fixes his gaze on one thing. She is not divided or diverted by other things, as glitzy and flashy as they might be. On the other hand, someone with bad eyes cannot stay focused on one thing. They are are like a strobe light, flitting about here and there, but never settling on one thing interesting that in the ancient world, even today, the evil eye referred to a person who coveted what belonged to another. An evil eye is a greedy eye, even today. In this context about treasure, Jesus is saying, if someone's eyes are focused on earthly treasure, the heart will be full of dark. So the way to have a healthy soul is to keep one's eyes fixed on God and heavenly things. Paul said it this way when he wrote to the Colossians. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly. When we set our hearts and minds on things above, when we fix our spiritual eyes on heavenly things, we're able to see things as they really are. We have a perspective that is true. We have a a vision that is clear. We have judgment that isn't clouded or obscured. As the songwriter so eloquently wrote, when we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face, something happens to the things of this world. They grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. One of the results of turning our eyes upon Jesus is that we see the folly of putting our trust in money or things. We see, as Solomon eventually did, that money and things don't provide real security or happiness. They're hollow. They're like chasing after wind. However, if we divide our loyalties between God and money, our perspective will be skewed. Our vision will be blurred. 
our judgment will be clouded. We will have a dim view of eternal realities. And that's the darkness that Jesus is referring to. And the reason the darkness is so great is because when, we, when our loyalties are divided, we succeed in neither the goal of accumulating earthly things, treasures, or heavenly treasures, yet we are often deluded into thinking we have both. We are deluded because, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. By the way, Jesus is not commenting on the impossibility of working for two employers, okay? He's commenting on the impossibility of working for two masters. And there's a difference. In the first century, a slave was the property of his master. He belonged to him not just from eight to five, but 24-7. He was at his master's beck and call day and night. And the reason that it's impossible to serve two masters is because one, a person cannot respond to both of their demands. That's why. You may think, yeah, I get that. But I'm not a slave. According to Jesus, we are all slaves to something or someone, whether we know it or not. Every one of us serves and is devoted to a master. And you can only serve and be devoted to one. Incidentally, in Near Eastern thought, the words hate and love when used in a context like this, have little, if anything, to do with emotion. They have reference to loyalty or allegiance. If you love God, you'll be devoted to him. You'll be loyal to him. You'll serve him above all else. He will be your first priority. Pleasing him and obeying him will be your supreme ambition. You'll stay away from anything that hinders that. And if you love God, you'll hate money. Not that you renounce it or consider it evil, but that you won't be mastered by it. The pursuit or the accumulation of money won't govern your life. It's not going to be your priority. It won't dominate your thinking or your desire. But if you love money, it will be your master. Your thoughts will be consumed by what it can do for you. How you can acquire more of it. It will dictate what you do with your time and energy. And at the same time, you will also hate God. Not that you are repulsed by him or that you have bad feelings toward him. You may profess to love him. You may pray to him. You may worship him. But you hate him in the sense that you're not really devoted to him. You are devoted to money because you can only have one master. Anyone who divides his allegiance between God and money is really serving money and only pretending to serve God. So the big question is, how do you stand in relation to Jesus' words? Do you love and are you devoted to God? Or do you love and are devoted to money? Earlier I told you that the answer to that question is really not difficult to determine. Your actions reveal your heart. So, 
after honestly evaluating your own heart or if the Spirit of God has shined His light into your heart so that you can see where your treasure actually is this morning. And you have come to the conclusion that you've been a pretender. It's not too late to make things right. Up until now, you may have chosen, like Jackson Brown, to be happy and struggle for the legal tender. In part because you didn't know that it was even possible to serve only God or only money. You didn't realize that when you divide your allegiance between God and money, you're actually serving money and only pretending to serve God. I want to encourage you. Come clean. Be honest about the choice you've made. Acknowledge to God that you've been a pretender and then repent. Repent means renounce those ambitions and pursuits. Do an about face, go in the other direction. If you don't, you'll make the same regrettable choice that Jackson Brown made. A choice in which you forfeit something far more noble and enduring than the artificial happiness that money can buy. Let God help you. Surrender to Him. Give your allegiance to Him. Let Him change your heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, How we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be in your presence right now, reflecting upon your word, the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Jesus, we we do want to acknowledge that you are sitting on the throne of heaven right now that you are surrounded by real riches. I I, I want to acknowledge, Lord, on behalf of all of us, that, that when we fix our eyes on you, everything else pales in comparison. Help us to do that, Jesus. In your name.